Good morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we dive into his word. Father, we come to you this morning because we have nowhere else to go. Lord, there is nothing else that offers the hope and the truth and the love and the grace and the mercy and the peace and the comfort that is available at your feet. So we have arrived here in this place to worship you, to honor you, to glorify you, and Lord, to hear from you. So Lord, I pray that as we open your word and dive into this text, a familiar text for many, Lord, that it would speak new life into us, that it would be fresh, and Lord, that we would indeed experience what we have just sung and worshiped about, that you are the way maker, that you light our path, Father, that you have a plan for our lives, and that you never stop working. <coughs> Lord, some of us have stopped working, but you haven't. <laughs> Lord, sometimes we quit on you, but you never quit on us. And we are grateful for that truth. We are grateful for those who have just led us in worship for their hearts, for their passion, and Lord, for their proclamation of your goodness and your word over us today. Lord, bless this time. Be with us. Speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in Proverbs chapter 3 today. If you've got your Bibles, we've been doing a series called The Path, talking about um, staying on, being on, walking on the right path in life. So far, just to kind of recap our series so far, we've had two big ideas or two big principles, if you will. So for those of you, maybe this is your first Sunday, maybe this is your, uh, you, you're kind of getting caught up, you've been out for a few weeks on vacation or whatever, uh, let's just kind of go back and at least revisit the big ideas uh, a little bit. Some of y'all slept through the last sermon, so we, we need to, to revisit it for you as well. All right, so uh, the, number one, we said your direction, more than anything else, your direction determines your destination. That if you have a destination you want to get to, the number one thing you've got to make sure you're doing is be pointed in the right direction. Because if you're not pointed in the right direction, there's no way you're going to get to the destination. And, and we spent a number of weeks unpacking that principle, unpacking that idea from Scripture, that if we want to be on the path God has for us, we have to be walking in the right direction. Then we said that if you don't walk on the prudent path, remember we talked about that word prudent or prudence, which isn't a word we use a lot, but we all kind of know what it means. But if we don't walk the prudent path, we will walk a painful path. That the path of blessing is the path of prudence. The path um, that God has for you and I is a path that requires prudence on our part. It, it requires us uh, to do our part. And when we don't do that, when we get off the prudent path, when we choose to walk on any other path, that always leads us to a more painful path. Today, I want to focus on what I call the secret sauce uh, for finding and staying on the right path in life. Y'all know what the secret sauce is, right? Some of y'all looking at me like you don't know what secret sauce is. Secret sauce, like, like pretty much every restaurant has secret sauce, right? They, they've got that, that thing that makes them unique. I want you to kind of think of yours. I'm, I'm going to get your, you to participate here in a second. I want you to tell me uh, what your favorite secret sauce is, right? So Chick-fil-A has their Chick-fil-A sauce. They have a bunch of other sauces, but the only one that's really any good is the Chick-fil-A sauce, right? They've got the, um, um, the you know, I don't want to run through all of them, but, but every major chain, every restaurant kind of has their, their secret sauce. Some of you may have a secret sauce. I, I can remember in college, I called my mom uh, one day and I said, Mom, what, what's that secret sauce that you marinate steak in? Because I just, I like the way my mom cooks steak. It's what I grew up eating. And uh, so, you know, your taste buds get to that. And I said, I, I, when I make a steak, it just doesn't taste like yours. What, what is it that you used to marinate those steaks in, that, that secret sauce? And my mom said, uh, secret sauce? Uh, Italian dressing? 
That's all it was. It was just Italian dressing. I just never watched her pour it over the steak and let them marinate in it. It wasn't a big secret, um, but it was a secret to me. I needed to know what it was. So, so you've had a second to think about it. I want you to yell at me. What's your, what's your favorite secret sauce? Oh, Rudy's barbecue sauce. Okay. Anybody else? Chick fil A sauce? I tell you, that Chick fil A stuff, that'll get you. I mean, I think they got a little cocaine in it or something. It'll get you addicted. I went into a Chick fil A not long ago, and I'm not going to say where this Chick fil A is because it's, it's fairly uh, local, uh, just up the road from us. And uh, they, I, I went up there and I ordered what I always order number four, four count. And uh, they said, anything else with that? And I said, yeah, five Chick-fil-A sauces. Because I like the stuff. I mean, I eat it with my fries. I put a little bit of it in my drink. I like it. I just, I want it on everything. Put it on my straw, you know. It's good. And they said, oh, we can only give you two Chick-fil-A sauces, and we got to charge you for the other three. And I'm a pretty principled individual. So I said, oh, I'm not paying for that. No other Chick-fil-A in the whole world charges me when I ask for five. I eat at Chick-fil-A quite a bit. I'm not paying for that. Okay. So they gave me the two. I went and sat down. Man, I went through those two real quick. And then I, I was sitting there all sad. <laughs> trying to eat it with just ketchup. Oh, it was awful. So you know what I did? I got up, took my wallet, and went and bought me some Chick-fil-A sauce. <laughs> Gotta have that stuff. It's the secret sauce for them, right? You got Kentucky Fried Chicken. They've got 11 herbs and spices. It's their big secret. Nobody still to this day has figured out what the 11 herbs and spices are that set their chicken apart. But they got something uh, in there that's their secret. We all, I, I used to love the Bush's Beans commercials with the dog. Y'all remember that? And they would always remind you that it's a secret family recipe. And they're not going to tell anybody what's in it. We, we see secret sauce not just in food, though. We see it in technology. We see it in the automotive industry. We see it in the oil and gas industry. We see it in the stock market, right? Nobody wants to give you their secret for how they're reading the market and how they're anticipating what the market moves are going to be, unless, that is, you have $499 to pay for their course, right? Because here's the reality. When we find the secret sauce, Whatever it is, when we find the secret sauce for food or for technology or for oil and gas or for, for, for anything in life, we don't want the rest of the world to have it because it gives us a unique advantage. The normal response is to keep that knowledge to ourselves. That's what makes it secret sauce. You want to keep that secret sauce for you and you alone so you can profit from it. That's what we normally do when we find secret sauce, is we keep it to ourselves. But today, I'm going to share with you the three main ingredients, I don't even want to call them ingredients, the principles, the concepts behind finding what I believe is God's secret sauce for you to be on the right path in life. Now, I want you to hear me say these two things up front. The first one is this, these are not the only ingredients to the sauce, okay? We don't have time to get into all the stuff, but a lot of them are just real basic things, things you already know. You know, the other ingredients that you would mix in with these are things like reading your Bible, praying, going to church, studying, meditating, memorizing God's Word. These would be important things to add to what we're going to talk to today. You, you've got to do what the Bible says. You've got to kill your flesh Every day, and you've got to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Like, you can't get rid of all those things you've already heard of and things that you commonly think of whenever you think about following the Lord and living for Him. And there's even more things than those, but those are the obvious ones. Today, we're going to talk about three things, though, that maybe you haven't thought about as much. The second thing I would tell you is this. These aren't really a secret. <laughs> in fact, they're written right here in Proverbs 3, 5 through 10, very plainly and very clearly. And this isn't the only place they're written in the Bible. They're, they're sprinkled all throughout the Bible. So just like my mom had that secret sauce for the steak, it wasn't really a secret. I mean, you, you could go buy it today just like I can go buy it today. It's, it's not a secret. Um, you just have to know about it and then apply it 
to your life, or in that case, to your stake. So let's read this together, Proverbs 3, 5 through 10, and then we will unpack the secret sauce. Here's what he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own understanding in all your ways. Know him, and he will make your what? Path straight. straight. We're talking about the path. He will make your path straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. This will be healing for your body and strengthening for your bones. Verse 9, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first produce of your entire harvest. Then your barns will be completely filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. Do not despise the Lord's instruction, my son, and do not loathe his discipline. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, just as the Father disciplines the Son in whom he delights. The big idea for today is this, only God can do it. The thing you've got to realize about your life, this is a secret sauce for you, is only God can do it. In the end, whatever you're facing, whatever you need, whatever struggle you have right now, only God can do it. When you see somebody who is passionately and purposefully living in a pure powerful state where they are just walking with the Lord and you look at them and you go, man, I wonder what their secret is. I wonder what the secret sauce of their life is. I wonder why they're able to do that. I wonder why God's blessing them that way. I wonder, I wonder why they always seem to be on the right path when it comes to their walk with God. I promise you they have added these three things that we're going to talk about today. They've added these three things to many other things, as I've already mentioned. The first one is this. The first part of the secret sauce, first thing that maybe you haven't thought about as much as the other things that I mentioned previously is this. It's the word increasing. The word increasing. Just one word. Simple word, easy word to understand, but a hard thing to actually apply to our life. This is more of a concept than a single ingredient, just as the other two will be as well. But I promise you, people you know about or people you read about in the Bible, people that you admire and look at and go, man, they really always seem to kind of be on the right path. They are always the people who just seem to be where God wants them to be and be doing what God wants them to do. They're the people who are always looking for ways to increase certain things about God in their life. They know the power of this word, increasing. For example, they are increasing their trust in God daily. That's where our text starts, trust in the Lord. That's an increasing ingredient in their life every day is learning how to trust God. They don't have an easier time with it. They're just working on it a little bit more than you. They're increasing other things like their obedience to God's word. They're not just reading God's word, but they're actually increasing their sensitivity to it and increasing their obedience to follow it and to actually live out the commands that God gives them. They're increasing their sensitivity to the work of the Holy Spirit in their life every day. They're increasing God's fame. They're increasing his kingdom. Because they are the ones who are seeking it And they are the ones who are sharing it with others. In short, we might say they are growing Christians, growing disciples who are producing kingdom fruit for the glory of God. They're disciples who are firmly connected to the vine of Christ, as we read about in places like John 15. And this is really the heart of where we begin in verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not Rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, know him, and he will make your paths straight. Increase your trust in him, not yourself. Increase your trust in him, not your job. Increase your trust in him, not your health. Increase your trust in him, not this world. Increase your trust in him, not the media. Increase 
your trust in him, not the government. Increase your trust in him, not your wealth or your poverty. In all your ways, in everything you do, know him. Know him more. Know him better. Increase your relationship with your Father in heaven. The verb here is a powerful, powerful verb. And it, it, it means to uh, acknowledge, but, but, but it's more than just a simple recognition. It's more than just acknowledging, like giving God a wink or a head nod. That's not what it means. It actually describes an ongoing, intense knowledge of who God is and what he's up to in the world. It's an awareness of what God is doing in your life and in the world around you and an ever-increasing acknowledgement of what he's doing in your life and the world around you. It's a deep knowledge of knowing who God is and what he's like. Like so many verses in Scripture, this one is a little bit difficult to capture the full meaning of it from the original language. I want to read it to you out of the New Living Translation. They translated it a bit differently when they said this. Look at verse 6 with me. This is what the New Living Translation says of this verse. Seek His will in all you do, and He will show you which path to take. See, rather than saying acknowledge him, they say seek his will in all you do. And they're, they're stressing this idea of this verb that God has to be at the center of your life. That God has to be at the center of your decisions, at the center of your family, at the center of your marriage, at the center of your friendships. He, he's got to be at the center of your worship. Can, can I tell you, I think one of the saddest things right now in the world is how many churches don't have God at the center of their worship? They've got a personality or a band or a program or smoke and lights at the center of their worship, but it's not really about God. God's got to be at the center of our worship, y'all. And he's got to be at the center of your life. That's what knowing him and acknowledging him is all about, is, is making him the center of of your life. The bottom line is we need to know God in the closest and intimate way possible. And the way we do that is to increase every day, to increase our acknowledgement and our knowledge of Him. We have to do that in a way that allows us to be ever increasing. That we don't ever just get content with stopping where we're at and saying, well, I, I know Him good enough. No, you got to know him better. And you're never going to run out of things to know. Isn't that incredible? That you could follow the Lord for a thousand years and still learn something new about him every day. So always be increasing in your knowledge of him. Always be increasing in your knowledge of his, his will and your acknowledgement of it for your life. In his ways, in his plans, in his purposes, in his divine presence in your life. This thought here in Proverbs 3 is similar, or maybe we should say it kind of parallels what is said in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, where Paul wrote, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. He says everything we do, everything we say, every decision we make, every action we take should be done in the name of the Lord. He's at the center of our life. And it should increase his fame and his glory. Our lives should cause other people to want to draw nearer to Christ. Because they see how much of a difference he's made in our life. And they see how he's increasing in our life every single day. The problem is, many of us don't really know that much about God, though. Some people know a lot about the Bible, but they know almost nothing of God. You know, it's possible to know everything about the Bible, but not know anything of the Lord. Some people know a lot about religion, but they know very little about God. 
I can think of a professor I had in my undergraduate studies. I was a religion minor, and so we took different classes about world religions, and we went through all this stuff. And the, the main professor over our uh, whole religion department, if you'll call it that, was a very, very bright woman. She knew more about religion than anybody I've ever met in my life. She knew just about everything about every religion, at least all the major ones. But she knew nothing of God, wasn't a believer. Some know lots about religion, but nothing about God. We're not talking about increasing our knowledge of the Bible or increasing our knowledge of religion. We're talking about increasing our knowledge of God. Others know a lot about church, but they know nothing about God. Listen, I don't want to just know verses. I want to know the Father. I don't want to just know the laws of religion. I want to know my Redeemer. I don't want to just know how church works. I want to know how the Spirit of God works and how He's working in my life and your life and everything that's going on around me. I want to know God so that I can then really acknowledge Him in my life on a daily basis and He will be increasing every day in my world. I want to know his will. I want to know his plans. I want to know his purposes. I want to know his ways. I want to know his commands. I want to know his word. I want to know his character. I want to know him so that I can in some way increase his presence on this planet. This is what our verse is saying. When we know God and are able to acknowledge him, it says, and then he will make your path straight. It could also say he clears the path. He makes a way for you. Why is this important? Can I remind you of our big idea, only God can do it? Church, can I just tell you that there are some things only God can do? And if you're getting to know God and if he's increasing in your life every single day, you're going to see more and more that there are things only God can do. Getting, know, getting to know him is important because some of the junk in the middle of your road can only be moved by him. Some of the obstacles that are in your path, on your journey, you're only going to get past them, over them, through them, with him. Some of the problems and the difficulties in your life right now, they can't be moved by anything else. They can't be moved by money or power or fame or not even hard work. There's some things only God can do. There are some mountains only God can move. There are some walls you can't get over without God's assistance. And getting to know God in a real way in a way that acknowledges Him, it's going to get some junk out of your way because God is going to clear a path for you. Proverbs 16 offers this good advice in verse 9. A person's heart plans his way, but the Lord determines his step. You can't do anything without God. I've heard people say, man, I, I can't get through this without the Lord. Talking about a hard situation in their life. Or, man, there's no way my marriage is going to survive without the Lord. And that's, that's true. Y'all, I can't go to Walmart without Jesus. Like, there should be nothing in your life that you think, oh, I can do that without God. I, I don't go out to my garden to water my plants without praying to the Lord. I want him increasing in my life every single day. I don't want there to be any area of my life where I'm going, you know what, I, I can do that without you. The Lord determines our steps. There's nothing wrong with planning. There's nothing wrong with saving. But you know what? If you're not getting to know God along the way, you're going to get on the wrong path because he's the one who's directing your steps. So increasing is the first ingredient. When God gets bigger, everything else gets smaller. And that puts us into a position where we have a firm recognition that no matter what we need, no matter what we desire, no matter what we long for, in the end, we understand that only God can do it because he's increasing in our life every day. The second word is the word decreasing. It's the actual opposite of what we just talked about. This verse tells us that we need to be increasing in our knowledge of God and thinking about him in every area of our life. But this passage 
also tells us that we have to be decreasing in ourselves. Look at verse 7. And you might say, well, why is this important? Well, because no matter what it is, only God can do it. And if we're not decreasing, if we're not realizing we can't do it, then we're never going to acknowledge that only God can do it. See, when he's increasing and when we're decreasing, that puts us on a path that leads us to a good place. Because we're in effect, when we're decreasing, you know what we're really doing? When we're decreasing our flesh, when we're decreasing our own thoughts, when we're decreasing in our own um, a presumption about how smart we are and how wise we are and how good we are at everything, when we decrease all of that, you know what we're really doing? We're minimizing the damage we do to our lives by trying to run them ourselves. We're just minimizing the damage we would do to ourselves if, if we kept increasing ourselves. Look at verse 7. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. That means you're decreasing while he's increasing. That's the secret ingredient. While he's getting bigger, you're getting smaller. You're thinking more and more about what is God thinking and less and less about what am I thinking. And let's be honest, we're good at thinking too much, aren't we? We're good at thinking that we're smarter than God. We're good at thinking we can do it without Him. We're, we're good at being wise in our own eyes. We're good at thinking we've got this all figured out because we've been here before. We've seen this happen before. We talked to our buddy down the road who did it last year, and so now we think it's going to work for us this year. We're good at thinking. We're good at thinking we have a better handle on things than God does. But that's not us decreasing, that's us increasing. And the verse says that's not going to work. The verse says we got to cut that out. We have to be willing to decrease the amount of trust we place in ourselves and instead increase the amount of trust we're placing in God. There's a verse later in Proverbs, Proverbs 26, 12, that says this, Do you see a person who is wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for him. Wise in his own eyes. That's a person who's increasing, not a person who's decreasing. When you look in the mirror, who do you see? That man or that woman staring back at you, who's, who's being described there? Somebody who's wise in their own eyes or somebody who the Lord is increasing in their life? I've seen the face of a fool in my mirror a time or two. I'm not too proud to admit it. And you know what the saddest part is? Most of the time, it was in hindsight when there was nothing left to do to salvage the situation. And every single time, it was because I had increased instead of decreased. See, we have to have the attitude of John the Baptist. We don't talk about, a lot about John the Baptist. Man, this guy gets overshadowed so much in Scripture. But what an important role he played in the kingdom of God. And in John chapter 3, verse 30, he says these famous words, and you've all heard them before, and you know them, and maybe you've even memorized this verse. He must increase, but I must decrease. Sometimes I think we miss the significance of that statement because it's so familiar to us, and it's so easy to remember and say, and it makes so much sense. But if you read the context of what's happening here in John chapter 2 and 3, what John the Baptist says here is so powerful. You, you have to understand his ministry is at its peak. He's the man. He's the guy. He's the one the crowds are flocking to. He, he, he's the one that's finally hit his stride. He's got momentum Back up to verse 26, John 3, 26, and it says this. Now, this is before John says, this is John's response to this question is he must increase, I must decrease. But here's where it all started. So they came to John and they told him, Rabbi, the one you testified about, that happens to be Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the one you testified about and who was with you across the Jordan is baptizing and everyone is is going to him. 
You see, from the perspective of our flesh and from the perspective of his disciples' flesh, probably even the perspective of his own flesh, that's hard news to hear. Everyone is leaving you and going there. Everyone is leaving here and going there. Everyone who is following you is now following him. Everyone who is coming to listen to you is now going to listen to him. That would be hard news to get, wouldn't it? But John's response is perfect. And it's how you know he had the secret sauce in his life, and it's why we admire him. He must increase, I must decrease. God's presence and power and activity in our lives should be on the increase every day, while our own activity should be decreasing. The more and more I read about the early church and the disciples of Christ, the more and more I understand that this principle was at work in every single one of the lives of the men and women you admire of the Bible. Over time, they became less and less, and God became more and more and more. This was one of the undeniable realities that I experienced on our trip to Greece that we just returned from, walking in the footsteps of Paul. We don't have time today to talk about much of it, but we can see this secret ingredient present in his life as well, as God was ever on the increase and he was ever on the decrease. It was as if with every footstep he took, every path he took to that next city, God got bigger and he got smaller, and the things God did got bigger and bigger and bigger. He was always trying to just stay out of God's way and let God do his thing. I think that's true of everyone we look at and admire. When we see somebody on a spiritual path and we're like, man, they've got it all figured out. What's their secret sauce? Well, I bet you anything, God's increasing every day in their life and they're decreasing every day in their life. The problem is this. Our world today is just the opposite. Our culture today is just the opposite. It tells you the opposite of this. They're going to tell you Pastor Pete's wrong. Don't listen to Pastor Pete. That's not the way it works. They're going to tell you just the opposite, aren't they? Because if you look at our culture and if you look at our world, God is becoming less and less and less ever on the decrease in our culture and lives as we are becoming more and more and more ever on the increase in our culture and our lives. We just came out of a month where we as a culture celebrated sin for a whole month. That's just one example. We, we could give thousands. But God is ever on the decrease. They want you to decrease God in every area of your life, in every way in your life. They want to just pull God out of everything. They don't want you to have anything to do with God. If you're going to do it, that needs to be private. You need to do it at your church or at your house. You better not be increasing God anywhere. People are going to look at you funny. And instead, you need to be increasing yourself, increasing your status, increasing your wealth. Get on a path that makes you look good to everybody around you. Keep up with the Joneses. Be increasing. Make sure everybody knows how smart you are. Hang that diploma right in the hall for everybody to see. Brag about yourself. Pump yourself up. God needs to be less. You need to be more. That's what the world will tell you all the time. We keep becoming bigger and bigger and bigger in our own eyes, thinking we're wise and not understanding not realizing the damage we're doing to ourselves and the world around us because we forget that only God can do it. Whatever it is, only God can do it. And the result of all of that, the result of us increasing and God decreasing, the opposite of what we should be doing, the result of all of that is it puts us on a path that leads us to unpleasant destinations because we're increasing and He's decreasing, not the other way around. He must increase we must decrease. Here's the final secret concept or ingredient of the secret sauce. And we can't miss this one. It would be tempting to stop here. And this one will be equally as hard as the first two. It's summed up with the word rejecting. Rejecting. 
If our knowledge and love for God is ever on the increase, and if our self-perceived wisdom and love for ourselves is ever on the decrease, then there is going to be a collision that happens. And it's going to mean you're going to have to reject some things in your life, and you're going to have to give some things up. Because if God is increasing and you are decreasing, I promise you that's going to cause some friction in your life. There's no way around it. And if we're going to go on the right path, we're going to have to reject some wrong paths in our life and some wrong ways that we might otherwise be tempted to go in our flesh and our own wisdom. We're going to have to lay some things down so we can walk the path that God has for us. And this isn't easy, but it's so important. This is what verse 7 says, Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. This will be a healing for your body and strengthening for your bones. He says, honor the Lord, verse 9, with your possessions and with the first produce of your entire harvest. Then your barns will be completely filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now the context here is very specific and it's, it's very valid. We should be honoring the Lord with the first fruits of our labor. We should come into the storehouse with 10%. It's called a tithe in the Bible. We should bring that to the Lord, right? But that means you have to decrease and he has to increase. That means you're going to have to reject some things in your life. That means you're going to have to say no to buying some things or taking on a new payment or, or, or many things in your life, right? And that's the bigger principle I want you to see here. I don't want to just focus on tithing. I'm not trying to get you all to give more money. I don't want you to feel like I'm beating you up here about money. Because there's a bigger concept here that's a part of the secret sauce that, that goes far beyond money. And that is this, there just is going to come a place, if he's increasing and you're decreasing, where you're going to have to trust the Lord with all your heart. And you're going to have to reject and lay down some things that maybe you've picked up that are slowing you down and weighing you down. He talks here about fearing the Lord and turning away from evil and honoring the Lord with your possessions and the first fruit of your harvest. All of those things require some level of sacrifice, some level of rejecting what you want and giving God what he commands you to give. It means we have to be willing to lay it down. And you're never going to be able to do this in your own human will. You're never going to be able to do this in your own human wisdom. Only God can do it. When he's increasing and you're decreasing, he does this in you. The key to being able to reject evil And having a a healthy understanding of what it means to be able to lay things down is really wrapped up in this idea of what the fear of God is. You see, the reason most of us don't fully honor the Lord with our possessions, as is the context of this particular passage, is that we don't really fear God. We don't think there's going to be a consequence for our disobedience in that area of our life, but, but there is. So we just do what seems right in our own eyes. We're increasing and he's decreasing. It's the opposite of what we should be doing, but it's the reality of what's happening in most of our lives. But if you look at the people of the hall of faith, for example, in Hebrews 11, or if you look at the apostles like Peter and Paul and James and John, or if you even look at more modern people that you admire and say, wow, God's really doing great things in their life and they're really walking a path and God is using them. I promise you they all have this in common. They are all willing to reject anything and everything in order to honor and please God. Because they believe what God says is true. They believe that God keeps his word. And they have a very healthy fear of the Lord in their lives. Proverbs 14 says it like this. In the fear of the Lord, one has a strong confidence, and his children have a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning people away from the snares of death. The fear of the Lord. Can you remember a time in your life, probably back in your childhood, when you were faced with a decision? A decision to do the right thing or the wrong thing. And you might even look back at this decision now and it might seem very inconsequential compared to the decisions you make as an adult today. 
But do you remember a time in your life as a kid when you were thinking, man, I could do this or I could do this, and you chose the right thing just because you feared the consequence from your father? Or you feared the consequence from your mother? Can you remember a time like that? I can relate to that. (laughs) I can relate to that. I can remember a lot of times when I was faced with the decision of doing something I really wanted to do and doing something that I really knew I shouldn't do and I decided not to do it because I knew if I did it there was going to be a consequence if I was found out. And the fear of my father, the fear of my mother, the fear of the consequence was enough to keep me on the right path. Now that being said, I don't fear going to my parents' house today. In fact, we're getting together tomorrow evening as a family. I don't fear spending time with my father, riding in the truck with my father. I I don't fear being in the same room with my father. It's the same with God. The fear of the Lord doesn't mean you're fearful of the Lord. It means that you have a healthy respect for the consequence that comes with getting off the right path. It means you have a healthy biblical respect and fear because you know that he wants you to do the right thing. God doesn't want you to fear being in his presence. He doesn't want you to fear coming and getting in his word. He doesn't want you to fear spending time with him. He doesn't want you to be scared whenever you hear his voice or he shows up in your life. You notice how many times when Jesus shows up or or an angel shows up, what do they say? Don't be afraid. (laughs) He doesn't want you to be afraid. He doesn't want you to be scared. But understanding that he is all-knowing all seeing, all understanding, that he is everywhere all the time, that there's nothing and nowhere you can hide from him, understanding that he is all powerful, that should put a healthy level of fear in your spirit that says, I'm going to do the right thing. He's going to increase, I'm going to decrease, and that's going to mean I'm going to have to reject some things in my life. And I know what some of y'all are thinking. I know what some people who are listening right now are thinking. Yeah, but God's love. God is so sweet and tender. He just wants to cuddle with me. He doesn't want me to be scared. He's full of love. You're right. He is. But never forget it was his love that put Jesus on the cross and crushed him. He loves you, but that does not mean he will not discipline you. He loves you so much that he will make the hard decision and let you fall flat on your face. Yeah, his love will pick you up and it'll be there for you. But it doesn't mean there won't be a consequence. Look at verses 11 and 12. Do not despise the Lord's instruction, he says, my son, and do not loathe his discipline for the Lord disciplines the one he loves. Just as a father disciplines the son in whom he delights. If you think that because God loves you, he won't discipline you, My friend, you are sadly mistaken. God does discipline those he loves, just like you discipline your own children because you love them. You see, understanding God's love brings about a healthy fear in your life because you understand out of love, he'll take you to the woodshed and he'll discipline you so you never forget and you never do it again. And next time you're faced with that decision, you say, you know what? I'm going to reject that nonsense, and I'm going to let him increase. I'm going to decrease. I'm going to reject this nonsense and follow him and stay on the right path. Oh, he'll discipline you. See, if you want to have the secret sauce in your life that's going to set you apart, make you different, 
You're going to have to add these ingredients to your life. There's no way around it. He's got to increase. Increase all things God. Decrease all things you. Reject all things of this world. That's the best way to say it. Increase all things God. Decrease all things you. Reject all things of this world. And never forget that no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're dealing with, and no matter what you need, in the end, only God can do it. Before I close, can I just say that God does love you. He loves you so much that he put his son on the cross for you. And if you have never given your life to him, you should do so today. You should give your life to him. You should call on him as your Lord and Savior. You should be saved this hour right now. Repent, confess, believe, be saved. And then let him increase while you decrease and watch him work in your life. This secret sauce is good stuff. I pray you sprinkle it all over you this week. Call on Jesus if you haven't. Let's pray. If that's you, I want you to pray with me. We don't ask you to come to the front. We don't ask you to raise a hand. We don't even ask you to meet us in a secret room afterwards. But if you're here today and you have never experienced the love of God, the forgiveness of his blood, and the power of the cross, we invite you to repent this hour. Say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner and that I've messed things up. So I come before you and I repent of my sins. Lord, I ask that you would forgive me, change me, make me new. I thank you for your grace and for your goodness, for your love and your peace. And I thank you for the reality that you have made a path for me to heaven through the cross. Lord, as we close, we thank you for those who have followed us today through this message and it has ultimately led them to new life and you have pulled them out of the pit. You have rescued them from their sin and you have cleared a way to heaven for them. We thank you for that. And Lord, I pray for those who are here today who have identified some things as we've been talking that they need to decrease in their own world so that you can increase in their world. Father, give them the courage to do that. Give them the courage to follow you. Knowing that at the end of that path is blessing for them and for you. Lord, I pray that you would just help them to see it and to know it. Help us to be diligent as your disciples to make sure you are ever increasing, we are ever decreasing, and that we are following your word and doing our very best to honor and glorify you with what you've given us. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We ask and we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.